So I'm so delighted to be on this call today, uh, talking with Janie Brown and three dear friends of ours. I will introduce Janie briefly, then I will ask each of the other panelists who are with us to introduce themselves. Um, and then um, I will ask Janie uh, to read us a poem and we will begin. So that's how we're gonna start today. Um, Janie Brown is a dear friend and colleague. Uh, she is the author of an extraordinary new book, Radical Acts of Love, Finding, uh, uh, let's see, it's, the book is, uh, how does it go, Janie, Finding Hope? Uh, how We Find Hope. At okay. end. Yeah. Right, thanks. The, the, sorry, because the, uh, the title of the piece here we adopted it was finding hope in the face of COVID-19. Um, Janie is um, a, a nurse raised in Scotland, uh, educated with a master's in psychology at St. Andrews University, master's in nursing at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And she worked for many years as an oncology nurse uh, at BC Cancer in Vancouver. Um, and in 1995, inspired by the Commonweal Cancer Help Program, she founded the Callender Society in uh, Vancouver. And I just want to say that the Callender Society, who, which does cancer help program retreats, is in my mind simply a world-class center uh, for the highest quality uh, work uh, with cancer patients. So uh, it's been a deep honor to be a uh, colleague of Janie's for well over 20 years and uh, to be working with her um, and with uh, Diana Lindsay and uh, uh, Lady Bird Morgan uh, in uh, uh, the Healing Circles work and with Daphne Lowe. <laughs> so uh, with that brief introduction, uh, Diana, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Diana Lindsay, and I'm one of the co-founders of Healing Circles Langley and Healing Circles Global. <clears throat> it's a pleasure Wonderful. to see Janie and Daphne today. Wonderful. Lady Bird, would you introduce yourself? Hi, good morning. My name is Lady Bird Morgan. I'm a senior staff member at Commonweal, working with Healing Circles Cancer Help Program, and I'm the executive director of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. Thank you. And Daphne, would you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Daphne Love, and I'm a palliative care physician in Vancouver, Canada. And I work in a tertiary care teaching hospital, as well as a smaller community hospital that has an ICU. And I work in the community providing palliative care uh, to patients at the end of life. Thank you. I also work at Ka uh, Kalanish, of course, <laughs> which is probably my, my best work. But no, I'm only kidding. I, I'm, I'm happy to do all the range. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Janie, would you start us off with a poem? Well, I'd love to. Thank you so much for inviting me, Michael. And it feels like a coming home watching everybody come online. And uh, our communities are very beautifully connected. So thanks for the invitation. I'd like to read a poem uh, by David White. I ha There's many poems I could have chosen for this morning, but this poem has been coming to me in this time, and I've read it many times to myself over the last few weeks, and it's a poem that I think really speaks to what we're living uh, in right now. And it's called Mamin by David White. Be infinitesimal under that sky, a creature even the sailing hawk misses, a wraith among the rocks where the mist parts slowly. Recall the way mere mortals are overwhelmed by circumstance, how great reputations dissolve with infirmity, and how you, in particular, live a hair's breadth from losing everyone you hold dear. Then, look back down the path as if seeing your past, and then south over the hazy blue coast, as if present to a wide future. Remember the way you are all possibilities you can see, and how you live best as an appreciator of horizons, whether you reach them or not. 
admit that once you have got up from your chair and opened the door, once you have walked out into the clean air toward that edge and taken the path up high beyond the ordinary, you have become the privileged and the pilgrim, the one who will tell the story and the one coming back from the mountain who helped to make it. David White. Thank you, Janie. So I suggested uh, uh, before we started that we might start this morning with just brief check-ins with each of uh, the panelists uh, who are here. Um, and I'll start myself just as a, as a model of uh, what I have in mind. Um, I'm doing well. Uh, I think the truth for me is that this is a very beautiful period of time for me personally. Um, just not running around to meetings and conferences, working from home. I'm in better physical shape than I've probably been in for over a decade. I'm getting a lot of exercise. I'm out in nature. Uh, it's very beautiful personally. And as an introvert and an Enneagram 5, for those of you who follow Enneagram, I love this kind of internal space. And so I think in many ways, I would be quite happy to spend the rest of my life in this kind of introverted uh, home-based space. Um, so of course, the horror of what is happening in the world is overwhelming in its intensity. But my nature is to feel born for this period of time. So I'll just offer that as an example. And Lady Bird, would you go next and say how, how you are? Um, sure. Uh, I think in some ways I would echo some of your sentiments, Michael, that holding the what's happening in the whole world at the same time as my own personal experience and being in West Marin and this beauty um, has been quite challenging. So I think today what I've been trying to cultivate the most is um, understanding what love means inside of me. Um, in preparing for this talk today, I was thinking about Ram Dass's comment about we are love, and that never used to make sense to me. I used to feel like it was somewhat hokey. And then I, it's something transformed where I understood that if, if I'm feeling love, then what's in front of me can experience that regardless of what I think about it on the surface level. And that was really helpful for me. And I think during this time, I've been trying to cultivate that understanding and that feeling in my body, not even an understanding, but just um, a body feeling of what love feels like so that I can respond to someone who's sick or someone who's happy or both of them and not have a judgment around any of it. So that's what Thank I'm you. Today. Thank you. Diana, would you go next? Well, I feel today the two sides that Janie's poem had within it. I, this has been a time of deep personal grief for me. I've lost my husband two months ago, and I lost my best friend two days ago. Not to COVID, but to cancer. And in both situations and among many cancer patients that we're still working with, this is a really hard time to have cancer at the end stage. And it, in my best friend's case, it's hard because she was a, a woman of deep community and the community had to stay away. And so today we will bury her in a car procession that will drive around honking horns at the burial site but none of us are allowed to get out of our cars. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way that we can celebrate her, but not the usual one. Mm -hmm. And at, at the same time, the, talking about the edge, I'm so excited by what Healing Circles Global is fast becoming. We had our first online training this week with just wonderful, soul-filled, heart-filled people. And we saw that we could do a lot online and we think that we can do a lot together so i'm i'm just living right at the edge of both and for those who want to engage you can go to healingcirclesglobal.org and learn how to connect right absolutely please yeah, yeah yeah daphne how are you today how do you find yourself 
I find that um, I, I have a kind of an underlying constant feeling of being unsettled. And I think it's, um, I, it's worse when I get too far ahead of myself. If I think relative to work, what's coming or what if we don't keep social distancing, what's going to happen at the hospital. So I kind of have the, the what ifs that come in and kind of make me more unsettled. And, um, and so I find if I can stay in the present moment, it's really helpful. And I, unlike you, Michael, I'm an extrovert. And so I'm also finding that a lot of the ways that I replenish that actually feed me to be able to do my best work, I'm not able to do. And so I'm having to figure out other ways to do that. And, and they're not as natural. And so I'm finding it a particularly hard time uh, for many reasons and just don't feel myself. I'm, I'm finding ways to continue to try and work in a heartful way. Um, but for instance, the idea of having not having our May retreat, like the Kalanish work, the retreat work, so feeds me and so sustains me for doing my hospital work um, that I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of slightly anxious about not having that. And then I get far ahead, when will I have that again? So, so I'm having to figure out new ways to kind of feed my soul and my heart and kind of keep me more grounded. But I have this, I have this constant sort of unease about me, which I'm not used to having. So I'm having to adjust to a lot. And, and, the, and the final thing I'll say is um, a lot of our family is, is far, far away, long plane flights away. And, I'm, and my father died recently. My mother just bereaved. She's all alone and she's in her 80s in her own home. So there's all these, again, we all have these worries. But then if I get too far ahead is when am I going to see my family again? And will I see my mom again before she dies? You know, so all those things. So I, I think I have to just keep pulling back to the present moment. So the Buddhist teachings in the present moment, that's what's saving me at the, at the, at the moment. Thank you. And Janie, how does this day find you? Mm. Well, I, I, I do best when I'm connected to the people I love and care about. So that's one aspect. So uh, imagining being here with all of you and to see people's names come up. There's a lot of pe people online from Vancouver and around our province here. That fills my heart because it's the way that I can show up uh, in my life being um, in relationship. And of course, this deep work that we've all been engaged with is, uh, is you know, again, how we show up with our gifts. So the other part is the, you know, the constant intrusion in a, in a sense of our community and our world. And already this morning, there's been an email from someone in distress whose wife is dying in palliative care in conditions that are not ideal. So I think, again, that's my service aspect of myself, that if I can be of use in this time, as I always you know, feel in my life, I think many of us do who are born into service work, then I feel I can be useful. And so that's you know, what I keep orienting to my people that I love and care about, to my own self and making sure I can you know, be as steady as I can on the roller coaster. So this morning I feel filled with a lot of love and connection to the Commonweal community who is, you know, so dear to me, having come down there 25 years ago and been inspired by you and Rachel Remen and the Commonweal community. I feel, um, you know, I wouldn't be here today doing this work without Commonweal. So I just, in my deep gratitude, um, to what's been given and what kind of lit my flame 25 years ago. It's our 25th year this year at Kalanish. Um, and how we can, you know, each find our way of offering something small or great in this world. Then I think we can carry on through these incredibly challenging times, um, you know, standing up and say, well, this is what I can do as opposed mm -hmm. to what I can't do right now, which we're also dealing with. So thanks mm -hmm. for the invitation. Lovely. Oh, to be here. Wonderful. You know, there's so many ways we could start this, but the power of story is so great. Mm -hmm. And your book is so beautiful. And I wondered if you might start us just by reading something from your book. Oh, that's a lovely invitation. I'd love to. I, I have a, I mean, it's hard to choose something, but I've yeah. got a, a three minute uh, read that I could do right now. And yeah. I, I think it's about um, just to say in this time, you know, how, 
the mystery is so helpful. You know, in the midst of our deepest challenges, a moment will open up in surprising ways. And I think the story to me speaks to a moment. And I'll just give it a small backstory. Uh, a dear friend of mine uh, in her mid 60s, who I, I had worked with her for years in the therapeutic touch community with Dolores Krieger. And she's a nurse and uh, she, she was diagnosed with a sarcoma and was in the terrible position of having to consider an amputation for surgery um, at her uh, stage of life. And she was heading over for the appointment with her oncologist that, or her surgeon that would tell her, is this going to in fact happen, have to happen? And she was on the ferry with her husband early one morning, one rainy morning. And I'm going to just take this is an excerpt from a story called Pod. It's about a three minute section. <clears throat> So this is the story she recounted to me about why the meeting with the surgeon went as well as it did. So this is pre-meeting. She dragged herself out of bed that morning with an enormous sense of dread at the prospect of meeting the doctor. He would tell her the results of the tests and whether the sarcoma had spread to other parts of her body. He would also recommend the type of surgery she was to undergo. Rachel had slumped low in her seat on the ferry, oblivious to the presence of Michael, her husband of 25 years, beside her. She told me that she had felt as though she was alone on a raft, set adrift at sea, no way back to shore and no land in sight. About 15 minutes after departure, Rachel recalled being vaguely aware of hearing an announcement over the ferry's PA system. She heard Michael mutter something about a pod of orcas off the starboard bow. Rachel shook her head when he suggested she come out on deck with him. She remembered looking down at her running shoes and noticing that her laces were undone. She hadn't bothered to tie them up when she'd left the house earlier that morning. I don't want to go out in the rain. I've seen orcas before, I'll see them again. She felt unlike herself, estranged from the person who loved to kayak in the Johnston Strait and sleep outside on warm summer nights. Suddenly, a strong, invisible tug pulled Rachel up and out of her seat, a force too powerful to resist. She stepped outside into the wild and blustery early morning light. The sea was steely gray, and the almost black sky merged with the ocean at the horizon. The ship's deck glistened in the wet, and the rain pelted her uncovered head, plastering her hair to her scalp as the wind pushed open her unzipped fleece jacket. She noticed Michael and three other people huddled together at the furthest point forward on the starboard deck looking out to sea. Joining them, she leaned over the deck's railing and saw the first flash of black and white as a large orca surfaced about 100 feet from the ferry. A thrill of delight coursed through her body Soon she counted seven or eight orcas surfacing and diving in and around one another, their dorsal fins pointing to the sky. A plume of spray from a blowhole shot up into the air before the orca disappeared beneath the surface of the frothy backwash. A couple of young ones mimicked their mothers dipping and diving, and Rachel knew that this was likely a resident pod, which would include up to four generations. Standing on the deck in the wind and the rain that day, Rachel thought it was just likely a lucky moment seeing the orcas, but she hoped it was more than that. She wanted to believe they had come to support her, to lift her out of her isolation and despair. She had read that when one orca in a pod gets sick, the others take turns supporting their ailing family member from beneath. Rachel's perspective expanded. She sensed a lineage of multiple generations of West Coast people who had lived and died along the shoreline for thousands of years. No matter how long she lived, she knew she'd always be remembered within that collective story. Whatever the surgeon would tell her later that morning, whether she would die soon or live for a long time, it didn't matter. Life was unfolding for her as it had for countless people and species throughout time. At that moment of expanded awareness, Rachel had fallen in to a profound stillness. She called it grace. 
She told me that the peacefulness had stayed with her all the way through the meeting with Dr. Leston, who in fact did tell her she needed to have a, a high amputation. And she was able to sustain that meeting. So Beautiful. A, small, a small aspect of one story of the book. I want to go into silence with that for a moment and just sit with that story for just a moment. Peace, peace. So Janie, um, it's such a deep joy. Neither of us love technology. Let's start there. <laughs> and both of us have devoted our lives to healing work with people with cancer. Um, and we have this wonderful lineage, which by the way, it's important to say it didn't start with Commonweal. We learned from the Bristol Cancer Help Program in Bristol, England, and from the anthroposophical hospitals in Europe. And of course, this lineage goes all the way back uh, to the temples in Greece and elsewhere where uh, patients came to await healing dreams. Uh, and so this is a very ancient lineage that we're all part of. Um, so at a very deep level, uh, and by the way, this is by no means the first time that human beings have felt that their world was coming to an end. That, you know, if you look back to Maimonides, uh, he would tell people they thought the world was ending soon. And he, he said you, it was forbidden to count the number of days until the Messiah came because they literally lived in expectation of that, as did the early Christians, you know, the returning of the Christ. So here we are again, uh, for the modern world, uh, there really, I don't think there's been a precedent. People talk about World War II or World War I, but never, there was the Spanish flu for sure, uh, but, since then, certainly, there has never been a moment, there's never been such an interconnected moment when the whole globe was connected this way, when we faced something like this. Mm -hmm. So, um, what questions are you asking yourself about how to be in relationship with this moment? Mm. That's a lovely question. <laughs> What questions am I asking? Um, <clears throat> There's many ways to answer that, so I'll just I'll just start somewhere with this. I it is unprecedented, and yet humans, uh, you know, for centuries have gone through personal catastrophe. So built into our, our structures, our DNA, I think is this lineage of fortitude, a lineage of a capacity to adapt, um, amazingly, watching this happen before my very eyes. So I suppose when we, um, we have that um, ability we, as a community, my question is, how can we help one another deeply tap into this capacity when many don't have it? We're looking at people without shelter, without food, we're people who are deeply in survival trauma. And there are others who are having blessed times, you know, these disparate experiences we're having. So how can we come together as a, as a global world and take care of the ones who weren't blessed with resilience, who perhaps came into life with a very difficult start, who never, um, who didn't have the resilience and didn't have the abilities to develop resilience. So how are we the blessed ones who did? Um, how can we reach forward in deeper and deeper ways? And, 
to me, this heart, you know, this, this heart that we work on so deeply in our work with people with cancer, you know, these qualities of the heart, you know, that's my question for myself when I'm frightened, when I'm on my own personal roller coaster, when I get too far ahead, I'm a great planner I like to live in the future and that's my challenge come back you know come back to here so my question for myself how do I live in this moment how can I be of service in a, in a true and deep way and how do I manage um, this intensity in a way that I can learn from it and deeply learn about you know how to develop this resilience and I you know, I think it's a moment by moment living. I mean, I can feel that in my own life. You know, there's a moment I, in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and I'm frightened for my, you know, my mother too, living in Scotland on her, with a caregiver on her own. What if I have to come back? So when my future encroaches on my present is when I suffer, which we all know well. I mean, many people in this community um, understand the practice of working with your own mind. And really, you know, those practices are, so I keep asking the question of, okay, you know, calm myself. How do I do that right now? And how do I then, from the calm, steady place we're all trying to find, then I can reach out in a more helpful way from that place. So this intense practice of personal work and then not get, getting caught in that of my deeply personal experience to saying we are involved in this wonderful interconnectedness in ways I've never felt it before. You know, when we can really connect through technology, which as you said is, you know, it's not my favorite uh, medium, but yeah, here we are having to learn and expand and adapt. And there are beautiful gifts. Uh, our groups are, I'll talk more about that, but they're, you know, they, they have, there's some things that are happening because of this need to connect globally. So that's maybe a start. Mm. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, all of us uh, on this panel are involved with Healing Circles Global, which we all started together about, I think it's about five years ago, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah. And um, in many respects, uh, it started, I mean, there are many ways to tell the story, but one of the first moments was when I drove up to Kalanish to visit with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you had come up 20 years before to Commonweal to train with us in the Cancer Help Program. And then you, and of course, we knew about your work, but we hadn't been in close touch. And when I walked into Kalanish, which is this modest, the headquarters is this beautiful but modest, quiet little building on a tree lined street in Vancouver. I don't think you have a sign on the door, right? No. Yeah, there's no <laughs> sign on the door. But it's this beautiful, quiet little building. And I opened the door, and you greeted me. And we walked in, and then we walked past the reception and kind of the Waldorf kitchen area on the left. And we entered this big, big for the size, a gathering room. And I sat down with you and looked around. There was a... I think, is there a statue of the Buddha there? There's a, a, a Kuan Yin. Oh, Kuan Yin, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I sat there and I don't know quite how to say this, but many of us have the experience when we're in sacred space that the sacredness of the space is palpable, that you feel it. It's like an atmospheric pressure of some kind. <laughs> and the power of the atmospheric pressure in that space, the way I describe it, it was so thick you could cut it with a knife. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so powerful. And I said that to you, and you said, yes, uh, delivery men uh, sometimes show up here and just burst into tears. <laughs> and so there's this immense power. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I feel is that I don't, there are quite a few of our colleague centers, including Commonweal, that do really beautiful work. You have stayed so focused and so concentrated on that one piece of work for over 20 years that the power of spirit and soul that has become concentrated in that space is simply palpable mm -hmm. in a very deep way. It reminds me 
of, you know, I, I have a great love of going into, uh, particularly in Europe, empty Catholic churches that have been prayed in for mm -hmm. thousands of years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and th it's like those walls have developed, have, th all that prayer has created an atmosphere in those mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to be there for the services. I just want to sit in silence, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. but that quality of depth. So I suppose where that leads me is there are different directions that we can take this effort at service. One is expansion. It's how many people can we reach through Healing Circles Global? And how do we, in the face of all this suffering, uh, how do we offer circles mm -hmm. to all those who are suffering? Mm -hmm. But the other dimension of it is the focal intention of deep work with a small number of people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And because that's your proclivity, that's where you find yourself mm -hmm. most. Uh, when you ask yourself, as you just said, how do you serve all those who are not fortunate in this situation? Are you drawn deep into deep work with small numbers or are you tempted to try to offer what you have found in depth to larger numbers of people? Uh -huh. Such a great, great question. One I, I'm thinking a lot about, uh, Michael. Um, I, I, I remember that day when you walked into our space and I, I remember we hadn't seen each other for 20 years and you arrived and you stood in this space that you're describing mm -hmm. and said, okay, I'm done. I don't need to, I don't need to ask you about your work. <laughs> I can go back now. <laughs> I thought that was such a great moment. Yeah, okay, I get it. <clears throat> so, you know, we're describing sacred space and temple space, for want of a better word. And I, I, I believe we can create um, temples, you know, where we walk. And there's, of course, natural temples in nature. But I spent three years um, wandering the world finding sacred spaces that seem to speak to me uh, like you need you know go now to easter uh, rapa nui easter island and see those moai you know go and stand on that ground and it wasn't enough i as a kid i'd looked at those images of the moai uh, and i thought oh one day i'll have to go there and, and same with egypt i wanted to go and stand on the nile and stand in the temple of luxor as you're describing in your you know going into these places of worship uh, places where people have dedicated to a relationship with a larger perspective or the divine however you name that um, <clears throat> so that when i realized i had to go to those places it was i wrote a poem when i stood outside the the main uh, pyramid in, in Egypt. And I read a poem about gathering up the energies of a place. You know, it's like, well, that's what it felt like. I was going there and I need, my body needed to gather it up somehow. I don't even know what that means, but I, I understand it. My body understands that. And I think when you stood in the space, you felt something that, you know, again, is contained in a lineage. You're right. It's not that, you know, there's a group of us as there's a group of you at Commonweal. And, when I left Commonweal after my very first uh, workshop, the Tradecraft workshop with you and Rachel, I left thinking it's the people that make the temple, right? So then that was my first understanding. It's this group of people who are deeply connected in love and care for one another. They happen to be, you know, this expert and that expert, but really that was seemed irrelevant. I thought, no, it's the way they relate to each other, the way they respect one another. And it's like a temple space, no matter what the exterior or the interior was like. Um, then, of course, I've learned over the years that, um, you know, the space itself and um, the, you know, I have a, a dear indigenous friend. She said it's a third. Healing is a third the space that we reside in, a third the medicine men and women and the third the medicine itself. So if that's the model for healing, I'm not sure that's one then the spaces are very, very crucial. And I think about, you know, a, a nurse with a dying person and the space that you can create between two people can be a temple, right? And I, so it's, it's the space contributes and 
uh, but it's it's necessary to think about the environment, but also to make the best of what we have. So yesterday, interestingly enough, I was talking, I'm here at Callanish right now, and we said, how does it feel now? What's happened to the energy here? Are we, do, we, do we feel that it's still here? Mm. And I can feel that it's still here, but it, you know, we used to, it's kind of flatter. Like, you know, it requires this imbuing or, in, you know, invocation in a sense. It requires people. And it's like the heart, you know, the heart opens in the presence of another person. We can open the, our heart on our own, maybe in nature, but it seems to me it's the interaction from one person to another that certainly opens my heart. So I think we need each other and we need our spaces to be, you know, as best they can be and we can tend our spaces. So I said yesterday, I think we have to tend the temple maybe even more now. Maybe we do have to, you know, I said, oh, I think we, we need to continue to sweep outside the front door, even though no one other than the four of us who work here are coming to this building right now. So, you know, let, let's keep sweeping. Let's keep, you know, tidying. Let's make it as beautiful as they would, I think, in temples around the world. Continue to mind these spaces, and I think these spaces create um, have a lot of energy around the world. You know, there's so many in every culture, every country, and of course, the Kalanish stones are dear to my heart. Um, and when I first went into that sacred space, I felt it, and then I felt the hands of five thousand years of people touching those standing stones. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, it's the people in relation. It's not a natural wonder. Those stones were placed by people. So our inter interaction with one another. Say again the three parts that the indigenous friend said to you. Well, the environment. So the environment yeah. in which the healing happens. Yeah. 33%, I suppose. Yeah. And then the people that walk with us, the medicine mm -hmm. men and women who mm -hmm. walk with us. The third, and then the medicine we choose. Okay. is a third so it's kind yeah. of it's not really yeah. how we see things in our system for sure our healthcare systems mm -hmm. but it's an interesting I, I mean i i think about that a lot when we mm -hmm. set up our spaces for retreat and even on zoom you know it's, uh, can i just say one thing about so we've lost two senses with technology uh creating sacred space online we've lost actually three we've lost touch and we've lost smell we've lost taste so we're left with three, if you think, I think of six senses. So we've got the hearing and the seeing, and then we have the sixth sense, which is the intuitive self. That's still available online. So interesting, how to create sacred space in a virtual space. I think many of us are in deep conversation about that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can speak more of that if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lady Bird, uh, you share i think um deeply this sense of um wanting to be in real touch with people and you've done all this work with dying people with zen hospice and and elsewhere as you listen to janie what emerges for you well, first i i was just deeply moved by the the reading in the book and i'm still sort of sitting with me the images of the orcas and and that um that way that we all just want to matter somehow that that our lives matter you know do i matter does the orca see me does the do the trees notice i'm here did my mother care about me like all of these levels that it really comes down to that that there's never any difference um for a person in a different country or a different culture and um, yeah, I, I am very much connected to the, the physical sense and things move through my body and that feels very important. And I'm so just, everything that you both are saying, I'm just kind of um, trying to digest. And um, again and again, I, I feel like it comes back to this cultivating the sacred within so that wherever you are, there's a way for you to, um, to access that either it's whatever it's through through reading or through sense or smell i mean the other day i had the smell this olfactory memory of my grandmother came from nowhere and it was so amazing and that was that was a gift you know that i actually had that um 
connection and no one had to do that for me. It wasn't a magic trick. It was just something that I was connected to. So trusting that in each human body, we have the capacity to access our own way to relate to the universe. And um, I know the healing circle model, it's so beautiful in that way, because you're the one, Diana and I were talking yesterday about the person sharing is the one having the healing in their own way whether it's through the Zoom or it's on grass or whatever that is, no matter what, we're still on the same planet. We're still in human bodies. All of those things are still true. And finding that way to remember what's true um, on those deeper levels so that you can ride the waves of just absolute overwhelm and disconnection and disbelief. And um, yeah, I think more and more, and especially in the prison work, you know, now that we can't go in, we're moving to a correspondence type of connecting and um and the the prisoners themselves are speaking to i can i remember that i know how to connect in this way too i i was getting attached to only seeing you coming in and having a conversation in a circle but now i'm kind of pulling my resources back to another way of sharing my heart and connecting to other hearts in that way and so our our resources are infinite um, if that makes sense, but it's there's a there needs to be a space to remember that and to actually embody it. Thank you, Lady Bird. Diana, uh, going back to the question I asked Janie about, I mean, obviously at uh, Healing Circles Langley, uh, what you and Kelly co created uh, has immense depth and personal closeness and specificity uh, and at the same time you share and are helping lead our effort to make uh, healing circles available very widely so how do you hold that question of um, the relationship between uh, wanting to offer something to many many people and knowing that when healing really happens, it happens in very deep trust and loving relationships. Michael, I, I just feel a calling. Mm -hmm. And that is to adapt to what is in front of us. Just like what Janie said, I think and what Lady Bird said, I think healing itself is an interact. We heal ourselves. Healing is, is an innate force within us. But as we've always said, we, we heal best in community. We heal better when we have someone there. It's just who we are as humans. And I feel this right now, trying to grieve alone, cut off from all those who are are grieving with me also in isolated places and it's very difficult yesterday i walked you know 10 feet away to the burial site where they were digging and just to be in the presence of others who are grieving is so oh it's so strong and so palpable and if we had our druthers all of us would love to be hugged and touched and be together in physical spaces. Of course, we would love that. But that isn't what's in front of us right now. And so the question for me is, well, then what? How do we be of service right now? And how do we make it beautiful? And I think there are so many amazing ways that people are making this beautiful. And partly it comes, uh, we've always said in the song we sing, is this space between people that Janie was alluding, we call it living sanctuary. And I think we can still create living sanctuary. And through that sixth sense that Janie mentioned of the intuitive. So yesterday we had 40 people on Zoom and we all reach our arms out to form a circle. And of course, you think you're, the person on your right is something, but it's not because Zoom is mixing you all up. But still, we could create that. And then through our imaginations, 
we could close our eyes and invoke the campfire. We could invoke each other's support on the rim. Our imaginations could bring us back there. And so I think we have new tools. I feel like uh, people can intuit and feel across spaces in ways we didn't give credence to before. It, I think it's deepening that non-local connection. And I think the other thing that, it, that people are bringing is they are bringing their grief and their pain into circle. You don't have to have a long process to access that. It's upfront and personal for everybody. And so there's a realness and an authenticity that even though technology puts a distance, there's still a commonality that binds us. Thank you. By the way, I want to say to the 110 people who are with us that um, feel free to use the chat function. It's a great way to talk with each other and I'm watching it and there are all kinds of wonderful things. And also uh, there's a separate Q&A space, but I'd actually encourage us to just use the chat function and put your questions there. I can't promise we'll get to them, but you'll see them from each other and you can answer them for each other. So I just want to encourage you to use the, the chat function. It's a, a beautiful way to have a multiple dialogue while we're talking here. Daphne, um, you've been listening to this. Um, uh, say more about how you mentioned at the start that as an extrovert, it's particularly hard for you to find the nourishment that you need to do the work and that you're needing to find new ways to do it. Uh, how are you, I mean, as a frontline palliative care physician in the middle of this, um, good Lord. And also just, my brother, uh, Adam Lerner, is an oncologist in, in Boston. He pretty much assumes that he will get this at some point. Um, and then he has his family, his wife and mm -hmm. children and so on. So just how are you holding the whole thing? You have to unmute yourself. Hey, Michael. Um... There is a lot to hold. Um, I, I think um, just a number of things I've thought about as everyone's spoken. My, one of my colleagues got it and I had to go back to work earlier because I had to cover uh, a week that I wasn't due to work. Um, he has recovered and I'm really grateful. Um, but even the uncertainty of knowing once you recover does that mean he could, should he see more of the COVID patients because he may be immune? But we don't always even know about, we don't understand immunity yet either. So there's always questions. But um, it's, it's helpful when you see colleagues have it and, and survive it and recover. And so that, that's actually been a helpful thing for me personally. But it is something that's always on your mind every time you wash your hands, every time you come home. I change in the in the garage and and put my clothes directly in the wash washer um so so you're so fastidious and your mind is so thinking about that it again it can take you out of the, the those more heartful places it, within your work so so i'm just again constantly having to draw myself back but as janie spoke about the medicine the the one third space that has changed so dramatically in hospitals and um, so a lot of our palliative care units have been moved to make more space for COVID um, testing areas and various things. And I, f I find myself currently working in a very suboptimal space. So I'm seeing families, um, well, patients and one family member. So the family members are limited. Fortunately, in palliative care, people can have a family member with them. So the space is dramatically changed in terms of what is available and privacy and family. And so I'm finding that I'm realizing hearing Janie speak is what I've got to focus on now is 
I've got to spend more time on the medicine and the two that we can control, the medicine and the medicine men and women. And so, so you realize, and you have to work with that differently too, because the medicine we're now covered. I have my eyes and my voice. So I, I can touch with my gloves on patients, which is wonderful. Um, but I, I've had to learn how can I use my voice and my words in a different way because I have to I can't rely on my facial expressions and my touch as much. So I'm kind of learning how powerful our words are and, and just really trying to focus my care and energy through my eyes. Even though you have goggles on, your eyes are still visible. But your facial, your mouth, you don't realize how much we portray with smiles and care and how our face portrays things as a unit. So I'm really working with, you know, how to do that with words. I, I was talking to a, a patient's wife who's dying, and she was just grief stricken because there's so much the grief is also added because they haven't any they can't have family support they're alone and in, in they're visiting um it's just it's so much is compounded so there seems to be even more grief than the normal grief of dying and she was crying in the hallway and i'm trying to keep some distance from her it's certainly not two meters that's you know, suggested, and I'm kind of reaching over and touching her arm, but normally I would hu hold, hug her, and I said at the end, I'm, I just so wish I could hug you, and and she said thank you, and she they, they're so grateful for what we do give, give, so they obviously are feeling our love and care, but I think there's a tremendous pressure on healthcare workers now, because, especially with COVID patients, because families aren't allowed in, that we feel the tremendous pressure to provide the love and care and, and support that would normally be there from their loved ones. So it, it's quite an extraordinary amount of pressure for healthcare workers, apart from the sheer physicalness of, of looking and the, and the mental of looking after patients. So it's, it's quite a profound time. But I think if we can realize the power of our connection, the power of our words, the power of, of, of the care through our eyes, and just really continue to focus that and hone that, um, that's what still feels like, that's mm -hmm. medicine, I'm making a difference. And to have the time to be able to do that is, has been crucial. So, um, so it is, it's a, it's a whole different atmosphere. There's amazingly different stressors than our normal stressors. And I think the other thing that helps, uh, which is the same for Commonweal and Kalanish is is working as a team and I am so grateful for my team I tell you we're in this cramped little space we can't get six feet from each other but in some ways we, we all wear our masks and, and, and cover up with each other but I'm sort of glad we're together because I feel like I'm in it with my team my nurses my occupational therapist my music therapist my my pastoral care they all had the option of not coming in to work and they a few of them started to work remotely and then they said, we can't do this. And they chose to come in. And it's like, we're all in it together. We're taking that risk, but we're doing it together for the patients. And that's what feeds me. And so, so having that team is crucial. And I'm, I'm sure the eMERGE physicians and nurses and, and the allied staff and even the, 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 patient, the workers in long-term care, they have each other. And so we have to stay well to support each other. And, and that has been so um, strengthening for me. If I didn't have my team, it would be amazingly difficult to do this. So I think we find these ways that will strengthen us to continue on. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Daphne. Janie, coming back to you, um, I was talking to our colleague, Rachel Naomi Remen, who's the co-founder of the Cancer Health Program and was with you and with me in the Tradecraft Program. And she's going to talk next week in, in this series. And we were talking about what the title was going to be. And what we settled on was uh, COVID-19 and the evolution of humanity. Ah. <laughs> so there's a real question that those of us who are drawn to the mysteries uh, must inevitably ask, mm -hmm. which is, um, is this just a random event? Is this a random event which is a result of humanity pushing too far into the natural world and uh, 
more and more of these pandemics show up because um, as we push into deep nature, these viruses or bacteria or whatever uh, jump from animals to humans. And it's just a result of environmental degradation and global transport and all that. Mm -hmm. But there is a different kind of question, <clears throat> which is whether or not one wonders about whether it's an accident, because one can wonder about whether it's an accident. But one can also ask whether it's an accident or not, what is its significance for the evolution of humanity? Mm -hmm. Do you ask yourself that question? Yeah, I think a lot. Uh, I do think a lot about that. That going back to, um, I suppose there's some. I have some concerns about trying to um, to put kind of this idea that you know this this has happened because of this. And I think when we work with people with cancer, we all know this that that's the most unhelpful, in a sense, an unhelpful view to say you know you're diagnosis happened because and there's endless things people tell you about why perhaps you had cancer so to me what's more important than that is to say well this has happened this is happening what are we going to do like you know when you have a diagnosis how am i going to live with this diagnosis and what's what's important because it happened this is how i'm going to you know adapt or live with this so i suppose that's when i think about um, I, you know, of course, I have a longing, like we all do, that we, that this is that this is a, a deep shift in paradigm. I mean, we can really hope for that. It's like intention, right? You can, I put that out every day. Let's, you know, hope that this is going to rebalance some things in the world. That's, I mean, I can hope for that. I can't say that for, you know, with any certainty that is what's going to happen. I mean, we've got. We have this dark and light that we know we're working with as tensions. So are we, so I think the most useful thing is because this is happening, how are we going to respond? And that's what we're watching very closely. I'm watching very closely how we're responding as a, as a, you know, a global, in a global response. And I have to say in, in Canada, there's just been a beautiful expression by our, government, our healthcare, um, you know, ministers across the country of such love and care and um, deep compassion for the people who are suffering in our country. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it moved me one day, our prime minister, Justin Trudeau stood up, he said, thank you to the children. Thank you for all the sacrifices you're making to stay home and not to be with your friends. And so this is what I'm watching. And if, if the heart can respond more and more, then our world will be a better place. There's no question about that. Um, did this happen because the world was out of balance? I'm not sure we can, I don't personally feel um, that part of the conversation makes sense to me because I think there's so many factors and you speak to this so beautifully, Michael, you know, with your work in resilience that, you know, there's so many global factors and let's hope that, you know what will come through this can deeply change you know our relationship to mm -hmm. to the earth to ourselves to our mm -hmm. families to people who are suffering without homes and medical care and all the rest mm -hmm. of it so that's my intention and then as we know with all intentions we have to let go of the outcome which is very difficult for us <laughs> it's very difficult for me i want to think of a better world and so i flip flop with oh you know who knows i think something we will survive this pandemic how we survive it and is really dependent on our actions now so all of the causes and conditions of how we are in our life moment to moment will affect how. And I, so I don't think it's, it's not laid out. We know it's not laid out yet, but it is dependent on how, how we each respond and how we each, you know, I think this is a time, um, what's unprecedented really is the shared vulnerability. You know, there's so much of our work, you know, we are work with people who are more vulnerable than we are in a certain way. And I think this is very, um, very deep. That we're all vulnerable mm -hmm. and I think that's shifting something about these divides between you know I'm the expert you're the I'm the healer you're it's not that at all and healing circles is really has spoken to this all along that you know the the leader in every chair we are um, 
you know, we're all involved in our own um, commitment to showing up as best we can with what we have. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm like you, I, you know, I read and I listen and I'm taking in many, many opinions and, and then I'm, I notice where my attention goes, you know, what, what I'm interested in. And I think when it gets into this predicting, you know, I'm the, the New York Times article this weekend was such a powerful, you know, predictor in a certain sense of the next phase. And I'm interested in that. And I, mm. I need to fill myself with learning. And then this great mystery that's working out alongside all of the facts and the science. And, and that mystery feeds me in a different way, you know, that we can hope. Mm. Uh, we we called this this talk to um, hope, and I I was thinking about hope, and um, I almost I feel like hope is almost like when the definition of pain came uh, to surface. There was a big discussion, especially in nursing, around the definition of pain. Pain is what the person says it is. End of story. So I think that was hope. I, I think hope is what I think it is. I, what I say it is for myself. Like my hope for today my hope for the world. And I, I think we're really entitled to our view. And I don't think anyone can tell us what we should hope for or what we shouldn't hope for. Don't be so hopeful or be more hopeful. I think hope really is a very personal uh, relationship to our life. And and, um, and there's times I feel hopeless. You know this about the world. And there's times I feel deeply hopeful and I think it fluctuates. But what's you know what's my relation to hope today? What can I hope to do today? And that helps me to focus. Okay, I could probably do something helpful today. Mm. And even if it's a day where I'm deeply sad and or angry or all the this incredible intense emotion for someone like me who has a lot of emotion running through, you know, what can I hope for today if I'm really angry? Well, I could hope to make a space for my anger, not leak it out to affect and hurt people, but maybe I could make a friendly space for my anger today. Maybe that's as much as I could hope for. And I could attend that, that tomorrow I wake up less angry. Tomorrow I wake up with a little bit more courage. So I think our hopefulness is very personal. You know, I'm realizing I'm going to want you to come back on this program because I was hoping today, as you know, to include a deep dive into your spiritual biography which is <laughs> one of my favorite subjects but that's not what's happening and i just have to let go of that piece and and now invite you back to do that when we can because uh, but i want to stay with where we are today and so uh, and let me just um so i agree with you it's not helpful to cancer patients to say you got this cancer because xyz but i also know from our work in environmental health over the last 25 years that the dramatic increase in cancer has been a direct result of toxic chemicals and bad diet and a whole bunch of other things and so it's not hard for me to say uh, i know for a fact that a number of these pandemics are arising because, in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, just like toxic chemicals, we go deep into these rainforests and these things jump from animals to humans. Mm -hmm. uh, but some illnesses develop enormous symbolic significance. So, for example, cancer is a poster child for having done that. Heart disease didn't happen, diabetes, asthma, lots of other things. Cancer became a symbol, and it's a symbol because uh, uh, if you watch the Nate Hagen's conversation that we did in our resilience uh, project, the, humanity is acting like a cancer on the globe. It is it's acting the way the same can it does when cancer reaches out and pulls in energy from all the other sources, and it becomes a kind of a you know a, a parasitic organism in the system. So I feel that COVID has the potential to become a symbolic disease, mm. just the way cancer did, which is a rare event. Very few diseases become symbolic. So why do I say that? I say that because here is a disease which requires that we distance from each other, which requires that 
we heal, as Rachel Remen says, we, we heal in community. And here we are told not to be in community, as mm -hmm. Diana was saying, grieving mm -hmm. her best friend when she can't, and her husband, when she can't be close to people, as Daphne was saying. So here we are with a new disease which distances us from each other. And we're still learning about it. I mean, the level of learning that's going on is extraordinary. So for example, we know it affects the lungs, mm -hmm. but some very significant number of survivors have kidney dysfunction. Mm -hmm. It can also inflame the heart. Mm -hmm. There's also all kinds of questions mm -hmm. about how many um, uh, chronic fatigue conditions follow from it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we are learning and learning about it and and what is our response our response is we will we will mobilize technology around the world mm -hmm. to find a cure and to find medicines that work right all well and good but then if you follow out what the implications are for how we get out of social distancing guess what it is we all need to carry cell phones that will track us everywhere <laughs> yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. and so what happens to privacy mm -hmm. and everybody's tracked and by the way how do you ever get out of being tracked because the idea is that the countries that have managed to do well with this how do mm -hmm. they do well with it they close their borders symbolically. Mm -hmm. They only let people in through quarantine. And when there's a new hotspot, they stamp it out with cell phone technologies and tracking everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the whole world goes online at a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. So there are all these ways in which symbolically, uh, this is transforming what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. All right. And so the question for me is, uh, and it goes back to the conversation I'll have with Rachel next week, what does this mean mm -hmm. symbolically, spiritually, and how can those of us who work in this realm of spirit, mm -hmm. what can we bring to this? Mm -hmm. Now yeah. you've answered very beautifully, and I think rightly about what can you hope for, for today, you know? But it seems to me there is a deeper and broader question of meaning making for us as communities mm -hmm. and in fact at a global level. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, what will that meaning making look like? Mm -hmm. And of course, I share with you the hope that we will move toward an ecologically sane civilization. I mean, we look at Canada from the United States and the compassion and power with which your leaders are responding. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into politics, but we have a, a modestly different experience in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, um, so there are all these meaning making. Uh, if, if Obama were president now, mm -hmm. there would be a profound meaning making process going on that encompassed everybody in the United right. States. And Angela Merkel is making meaning yeah, in sure. useful ways. And Trudeau is making meaning. Right. So how do we, because real meaning comes up from the grassroots, mm -hmm. it comes up from individual experience. Mm -hmm. How do we create meaning making understandings mm -hmm. of this terrible mm -hmm. global thing? We're just mm -hmm. witnessing the beginning. People hope it's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna go away. There are all kinds of countries that can't social yeah. distance it will be here with us we can hope that as many pandemics do mm -hmm. it will moderate over time pandemics that live with us over time mm -hmm. tend to become more moderate but we don't know that as daphne said we don't know whether antibodies confirm uh, uh, confer immunity mm -hmm. we don't know whether the um whether the constant mutations mm -hmm. will mean it's like a flu where you have to guess every year what the vaccine mm -hmm. will be Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm mm -hmm. just sketching out for your yeah. response yeah. a sense of <clears throat> the power of the question before us mm -hmm. of meaning making not only at a personal level, but meaning like making for our communities, for our countries, and for the globe. Mm -hmm.
And we, I mean, we haven't touched today on, <clears throat> on the, you know, the, the, the whole um, issue about death and our fear of death. And this response is based on an, an you know, absolute intolerance of that. And there, there's, you know, I, I, I'm watching that from a, a lens because, of course, that's the work we do. And I'm watching and listening. Um, uh, and so this meaning making is also, you know, bringing into this awareness of our deep relationship with death in, and the fear that we carry as, you know, as a culture. And there, there's a very, um, you know, I think this is a, a very important, it, it's sort of imperative that we, that we have, I think, deeper conversations about, you know, what is this? The social distancing is really around a fear of, of contagion, right? Of course, it's a very, it's a, it seems to be a very contagious disease. So, so there's a fear of getting the virus, first of all, and then there's a fear that you'll be one of the people that will react very badly to that virus and end up hospitalized and end up possibly in intensive care, depending, again, these factors, there's a lot of discussion about age, uh, you know, not being a correct factor for a determination of whether you get support or not. But, you know, we're really getting right down to very basic things here. And those conversations, um, I think we're, we've done some disservice, I think, to the elder population who have comorbidities and have had many thoughts, conversations about their relationship with death. We're doing a hugely protective, um, you know, this is like a global protection of the of the elders. Is that is that the response that they want? You know, their grandparents separated from their grandchildren. There's, you know, so we're we're in a very protective, and I understand we have to be, but I I like you know I'd like to open up that question too of where's the wisdom? I want to hear the wisdom as along with the science, right? I want to hear. Okay, what would it, and, and our relationship to risk, right? I remember a, a breast cancer surgeon saying once, well, it really depends on each person's relationship with risk, whether you wait, you know, if you have calcifications, you wait and watch, or you say out, right? And we have a very low tolerance for risk in our healthcare systems these days. So this is again challenging us to say, you know, we're, you know, and there's people being extremely rigid about their, you know, the protective of nature of this and protecting our community. And, and then there's other people who are, well, is that necessary? And then there's the rebels. And then, you know, so there's this amazing kind of personality um, uh, relationship to risk that I think we we have to talk about that as well and you know I'm, I'm curious about this these conversations that are having to happen about death in a minute space of time in an intensive care unit there was an amazing interview with a respiratory um, therapist on the radio this week about um, working with these young people that are coming in without family and having to work with their fear of intubation. And I mean, these are really intense. So this person who's probably 40 something never really thought about their own dying and having to suddenly be in a situation of what's going to happen to me. And I'm frightened. So working with the fear of dying globally and culturally is going to be, you know, many cultures do this a lot better than we do, but <clears throat> we need to be, deepening our relationship to death in our understanding and the meaning that has for each of us. I think it's a really crucial part of this conversation that I'm not hearing so much about. I mean, we're, we're having to, and there's so many grieving people now on this planet, you know, who, as we've spoken about, can't grieve in the way that they need to and want to. So I love that question of meaning making, Michael. I think it's a very beautiful and interesting one and certainly something I'd love to, you know, ponder more myself well i couldn't agree with you more that it brings up the question of our relationship with death and how many people are you and i know from our work that some people are afraid of death and other people are afraid not of death but of dying mm -hmm. and still other people are afraid neither of death nor of dying but of leaving people mm. or leaving something undone or simply uh, leaving the beauty of life. Uh, mm -hmm. Still others uh, see this as a way out, that mm -hmm. they've had enough. So there are so many different attitudes. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I just want to say, 
that when you talked about risk and our relationship with risk, you know, there's going to be massive starvation. Mm -hmm. It's already 187 million people, something like that, uh, are already on the brink of starvation, and it's going to double or more, whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you ask the people in the global south and poor people around the world, including in the developed uh, countries, tell me, was it worth saving 2 or 3% of... Uh, the population of the rich countries to close down the global economy so that hundreds of millions of people were going to starve? Mm -hmm. Is that what you signed up for? You know, that's mm -hmm. an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Talk about relationship with risk. Mm -hmm. And so we don't begin to know what the result of this global experiment will be. The countries that can't help but let it just run through the population. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have any alternative. Mm -hmm. How will that turn out? You yeah. know, the yeah. countries that make these massive efforts because they mm -hmm. are, you know, authoritarian, that they actually can control it with all these technologies. Mm -hmm. And the countries like the United States, where there's 20, 30 different experiments going on without, you know, so we can't yeah. know that. But coming back to the, the death issue, a central question for me at 76 and just having lived my life is, I love life profoundly, but I'm not afraid of death, but I don't want to suffer a lot. Mm -hmm. And so one of the key questions that isn't answered yet, because I've been talking to experts on this, is that the, neither hospice nor the compassion and dying states have good ways of ensuring that you get the medicines you need in the very brief periods of time that you have between the onset of this and uh, dying. And so if you don't want to go into <clears throat> emergency care and uh, receive ventilation, how do we ensure not only for the privileged, but for people all around the world, that people can have compassionate death. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a profound, <laughs> profound question. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that in some wonderful places, like where I live, I'm pretty much assured that hospice can get there within 24 hours, that you, know, you can get a comfort pack from the hospital if you run mm -hmm. in and get it, you know. Uh, but, in most places, that won't be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this talk about relationship to death. Yeah. This yeah. raises the question, which I think is far more important than how many ventilators we have. Right. Of how I mean, cancer patients have, in some sense, the luxury that uh, if they're worried about suffering, they can put together an emergency pack of some kind that they find their way to having that if it's too hard, they can take themselves out. That's mm -hmm. basically what a lot of people want to do. And usually they don't use it, but mm -hmm. having it gives them comfort. Mm -hmm. But here, we don't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just think there's the spiritual and psychological dimension of our relationships with death. Mm -hmm. And then there's the practical question of how all the people... Daphne, I'd love to bring you in on that. Um, what is your thought just about... Um, ensuring that people can die compassionately? Well, it's a very large question on a world scale, and mm. certainly developed countries are at such an advantage. But one of the things that we're finding is that we're starting to run out of some medications. So this, this is probably happening all over the world. And um, we're realizing that our supply chains are too sort of too narrow. So, and, and as we learned with PPEs and ventilators, but but these some of these basic medications like hydromorphone, which is a morph like a morphine uh, derivative or, or a medicine like morphine, and um, medicines like midazolam, which helps to uh, treat shortness of breath, some of the anesthetic medications um, they're using a lot when they intubate. So we're, we're finding that, that we're maybe having some shortages so that that creates a whole level of anxiety as well. Um, 
and whether they'll those supply chains will continue or or how that we're adapting we're using sort of different medications but even if we have a developed country with medications there might be shortages so that so there's no you know there's no guarantees for for going forward um, fortunately there are a number of medications that work for shortness of breath um, and that's you know it's the predominant symptom cough shortness of breath anxiety um, and so if we can get these patients uh, hooked up there certainly are medications that work very well for this it's just a matter of you know, is your healthcare system centralized? I mean, I'm so glad to be in Canada because we do have a, a, a healthcare system that is centralized and it feels like there's there's more kind of common um, shared control over it. And a lot of countries is very piecemeal and, and so it's not, it's not a fair system either. There's a sort of feeling that is fairer here perhaps. But um, it, it's that, it, it's sort of where you live and how connected you are. And I think the other thing that's different from a lot of my patients, whether it's, uh, you know, traditionally cancer patients or other illnesses that we see in palliative care is patients with COVID can decline very rapidly. So it's the, whether they get to the hospital and then get the referrals. So what we've tried to do is we've developed various uh, treatment protocols that we can get to the various doctors so they don't have to have a palliative care physician or contact you know and and many doctors know how to do that but we also want to even fine-tune it and get them even better at it and so we're, we're trying to get all this information out to to various uh, nurses and f nurse practitioners and physicians to use these um, so we're trying our best to kind of make it more accessible for everybody. But then the question that came into my mind as well is in Canada, we have physician assisted dying or medical assistance in dying. And some people choose that, but it takes some time and assessments. And I'm wondering whether there's even time with COVID if someone chose, knew they were going to die, would there be time to even set that up? Because that perhaps would be a compassionate way for people to um, end their life if they were going to die. But often that period of time is so short, the practicality is of doing that in our system may be difficult. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone here, but again, our numbers are quite low that have, have asked for that or chosen. They have to be conscious. They have to be able to speak. So it, it, it's very, it's a very uh, rapid, a situation so it's it's really interesting and we're just continuing to evolve and change things as we go um, making things you know changing some of the rules and how one accesses things as we need so it's a very alive system that we're trying to do but I think for me the more that we can centralize it and kind of do it together and share with you know not so we're not reinventing the wheel that the more efficient it's going to happen and the more people it will reach and the, the more fair it will be. But for developing countries that may not have medications and access, it's very, very mm. frightening. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're at uh, four minutes before the close. And um, before I turn to Janie for her last reflections, um, I just want to thank all of you uh, 104 people have stayed on straight through, so you must be appreciating it. The chat has been really wonderful and deeply grateful for that. We do ask you to consider contributing to sustain this new uh, enterprise that we're on every Friday morning at nine. You'll find us here with wonderful and interesting people sharing their thoughts. Um, I want to thank uh, Lady Bird and Daphne uh, and Diana for uh, participating with Janie. And uh, Janie, um, as you know, um, you are such a gift in my life and the life of your entire community up in British mm -hmm. Columbia. I urge everybody to get a hold of Janie's uh, new book. It is deeply beautiful and a profound contribution mm -hmm. to the field. There it is, Radical Acts of Love, <laughs> How We Find Hope at the End of Life, Janie yeah. Brown, brought to you by Daphne Lowe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so Janie, any wow. any uh, next week, by the way, again, it's Rachel Naomi Remen who like Janie. Janie and Rachel are the two greatest ritualists in our work. <laughs> I just want to say that. Uh, and uh, so uh, Janie is a magnificent ritualist and uh, so is Rachel. So you mm -hmm. won't want to miss that. Janie, your last thoughts and reflections. Just um, deeply grateful uh, to be here. And I, you know, I would love to have opened it up for questions and it feels like the time just an hour and a half went by and um, I've just so loved this way of relating to you, Michael, and, and in these ongoing conversations that we've had, especially in the last few years when we reconnected, I'm just honored to, to be in connection with you and your beautiful team at Commonweal. And so thank you from our community to yours, and the inspiration continues to flow. And I suppose I'd like to just end um, with a comment from an 89-year-old client of mine, who I didn't know because I haven't talked to her for a few months, but she wrote me this just fabulous email where she said, well, I just had COVID-19 and um, I was hospitalized and it was a pretty grueling 14 days on oxygen. But suddenly she said about a week into, a week or 10 days into being hospitalized, she said, I could feel my resilience coming back. I could just start to feel my energy change. And she said, now I'm home. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, Wow, like, you know, these experiences, as you, as you spoke to story, we need to keep telling our stories and we need our, our hopeful stories to balance the scary stories. And, you know, as we were just starting to get into that subject of, oh, I could feel my own fear rising, you know, and we need to, we need to talk about these difficult, scary things, but we so need these stories of resilience and hope and beautiful, compassionate acts that are going on, you know, in every moment. So. I love to balance those two things in my own life, and I'm just deeply grateful I get to be here with all of you today and um, to be in this deep conversation. So mm. thank you for having me. Thank you, and let's all end with just a moment of silence together. Peace, peace. And to all those who are with us today, even now, uh, staying on to the very end, um, this is such a beautiful community and there are so many friends I would uh, welcome if we all had time, but amazing people have to, chosen to be online with us. So mm -hmm. let's create community here. Uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, contribute if you can, if you'd like to keep this going and um, we are profoundly grateful to all of you. So love and prayers. Take care. Bye.